So while working on these slides, I thought of uh, go and look at the definition of cloud native uh, in cloud native computing foundation, because that is the uh, source of truth when it comes to uh, cloud native related technologies. But uh, uh, it's interesting uh, that I couldn't find the definition uh, in, the, uh, in the homepage. Uh, then I tried to search and finally hit this uh, FAQ section uh, that uh, it had a, a link about cloud native definition. But then again, it's a link and there's no description. So I clicked the link and it took me to this uh, uh, GitHub page. And it has a definition about the capabilities that you should uh, cover and then type of uh, components that you should develop. Um, and then again, about how uh, these uh, technologies are contributing and moving inside Cloud Native Compute Foundation. And my uh, assumption why it is a Git page, because uh, this is changing frequently. So uh, they want to change uh, this uh, uh, with the market changes as well as different type of feedback that they are uh, getting. So anybody can contribute to this page as well. That's uh, interesting. So that is uh, how Cloud Native uh, Computing Foundation define Cloud Native. So if you look at uh, how Cloud Native affecting uh, the industry, uh, so basically uh, based on this report, it's around 60 uh, 6.5 million cloud native developers in the world. And then it, it got increased in 2019 by adding around 1.8 million to this group. Uh, so while uh, people working on cloud native development, uh, they are using Kubernetes as the main uh, orchestration or the container orchestration system. And there are around 2.7 million um, uh, usage of this, and it went up by 4 million. And why it is uh, very uh, popular, according to uh, the uh, uh, one of the pioneers in Kubernetes development and uh, a main contributor, Cassie Hightower. So he said uh, it is becoming Linux for network computing. And I think he's uh, correct because it has become part of the entire cloud native journey. And uh, uh, like if you look at five to six years back, people were experimenting with containers and uh, container-based development. But uh, uh, now it has changed. It has come mainstream and even you can run production systems. And uh, based on this report, it's around 60% of uh, uh, backend developers utilizing containers in different stages. A lot of people using it in their sandbox environments. And as a developer, it's really productive to use containers when it comes to development. And uh, people heavily using it for testing because you can quickly uh, create a test environment and then uh, test your uh, code and other capabilities, and uh, then people using it for production deployments as well. So this is the impact and uh, the uh, increase of the usage of cloud native technologies. And this cloud native platform has matured. Now, if you go back to the history, this uh, the cloud movement started with the commodity data centers uh, Google built. Uh, to have a proper scalable mechanism because we used to have vertical scaling and add more and more compute power uh, to the machines that we used in the early days. But it's not a scalable solution. That's where uh, Google came up with this solution that you can have a, a horizontal scaling by adding more and more compute power, but as a user, you don't notice. So with that start, a uh, lot of organizations started contributing uh, to the cloud native um, uh, technologies by various forms. And if you notice the names that I have highlighted in this slide, basically the digital native organizations uh, pioneer in this effort. As a few example, uh, the big data came from Google and then Yahoo created Hadoop file systems and Netflix uh, uh, brought uh, concepts like microservices and Google invested a lot uh, in Kubernetes and then various other uh, cloud technologies like that. Uh, these organizations started uh, contributing to this uh, uh, particular effort. And if you go to the uh, the technology landscape of Cloud Native Compute Foundation, you will see this picture. So a lot of technologies and uh, since uh, it's kind of uh, 
uh, a lot of contribution coming from various uh, organizations and individuals. They have categorized these uh, technologies into different categories. But uh, as a technologies, uh, you might find it a little difficult to uh, pick the correct uh, technology for your use cases because that much of contribution uh, coming from uh, various parties. And I can play a game with you with these slides. I can ask you to find uh, the WSO2 logo uh, because uh, it's not easy uh, that many logos there. But if I point you uh, to the API section of the uh, this landscape, you can see us uh, nicely positioned there as well. So that is the landscape and where we are with the cloud native technologies today. So uh, let's uh, step back and look at what really happened. I think uh, Rick mentioned about uh, the market outlook and how the how innovation is important, and then uh, how these organizations, especially our customers and partners, are uh, working with these market dynamics. And based on this McKinsey report that they identified, the digital transformation has uh, uh, accelerated by seven years within few months during uh, 2020 especially uh, with pandemic, because if you look at some of the domains, uh, the digital is the only way that you can reach the consumers, especially at the early stage of pandemic. But now things are getting settled. But then again, uh, we don't think the world will move back to where it was before, before pandemic. So we have to deal with these digital channels. And people are uh, people have changed and we are living in a consumer driven market and even people looking for an omni channel experience that the same experience you are expecting from the web uh, same experience you are expecting from your mobile and same experience you are expecting from the iot or the devices that you are using uh, for various activities like it can be a gas station it can be a uh, automobile or it can be even a refrigerator so that's where the digitalization is there and then the uh, digital needs a lot of in, uh, in connections like you need to integrate systems you need to expose apis you need to connect with the uh, legacy systems you need to connect with uh, cloud applications so uh, the uh, the integration uh, technologies have improved and the demand for this uh, has increased as well that's what we see uh, with this 26 percent of the growth that uh, we saw in 2020 and we are expecting around 20 percent growth in 2021. addition to that uh, there's a huge investment going to cloud applications and uh, move into the cloud. Because if you look at uh, most of the CIO's uh, agenda, uh, cloud is uh, kind of a priority item that they have. And if you talk to an engineer or if you talk to an architect or a CTO, uh, they will talk about uh, a cloud because uh, that's the main focus and uh, the entire industry is working uh, on this digital movement, integration, by utilizing different type of cloud technologies. So the digital is not about throwing tech at business because you can't just uh, uh, take few technologies like cloud platform, IoT, or APIs, and then uh, tell the business, OK, we are building something that might be useful for you. Uh, that is not what the business Require. So the business is looking for a, a seamless engagement with technology and the business platform, like the business platform strategy and the technical platform strategy. Uh, because as I explained, we are living in a consumer driven market. So we have to look at what exactly our consumers are looking for and provide a seamless experience for them. So that's where you have to utilize the technology platform and connect it with the uh, business strategy. So that's where, as I explained earlier, this uh, a seamless uh, connectivity or synergy in between business strategy and the technology platform strategy should come in handy. And it shouldn't be two things. It has to be single strategy that organizations should take forward. Uh, so the innovative ideas, implementation plans, and then a different type of uh, projects and products that you are building uh, should align with these two areas and then have a single vision for the organization. 
So uh, exploring more about the market dynamics, uh, so the, this unique digital experience that these organizations are creating uh, is where the uh, competitive advantage or the competitive differentiation that uh, we create. As an example, like uh, you might uh, want to ship something uh, and when it comes to shipping, most of the providers are providing the same capabilities and the delivery time might be same. But uh, when it comes to uh, pick a service provider, most of the time what we do, we uh, pick the provider who's providing a seamless experience, who's uh, having a, a mobile-based uh, uh, application and who's providing QR codes, who's providing uh, notifications, that level of uh, digital experience. And then we compare these two um, uh, service providers and pick the uh, provider who's providing the best experience. So uh, that's how the organizations are uh, creating these differentiators. So if the uh, digital experience creates a differentiation, we can't buy everything. I'm not telling you should build everything. Uh, you can buy certain stuff. You can buy common capabilities, like you will not build a CRM system. You will not build a HR management system. You will not build a document management systems. Those are common capabilities that will not create a differentiator for your organization. So what makes a differentiator is the ex digital experience so that you have to build. Jeff Lawson, the CEO of Twilio, uh, he took this to the next level, build or die. Like if you don't build, uh, you can't survive. And that is what we learned from Kodak, Nokia, all the stories that we read about digital transformation. So if the uh, digital experience is the differentiator, you have to create that using software. That's where every company is a software company building products. And regardless of the industry, it can be food and beverages, or it can be mining, or it can be uh, transportation or hospitality. Regardless of this domain you are in, you have to become a software company and then start building these differentiators for your end users. And with that, we treat everyone as a developer because from the uh, business users to uh, semi-technical users to technical users, everybody has to be part of this journey and building these digital capabilities and delivering this, um, uh, this experience to the end users. And if you look at some of the De development uh, teams that I am uh, closely associated with. I see there are uh, domain experts or business users sitting with the uh, digital teams and building these capabilities because they know exactly how the end users thinking and they know what type of uh, uh, experience these end users are uh, looking for. So they give that uh, information and translate it to uh, technical capabilities with these technical teams and building these experiences. So that is this synergy that I talk about uh, um, in the previous slides about this business uh, platform and the technology platform. So the first step of this uh, uh, digital journey most of the organizations are moving to the cloud. And as I uh, said earlier, um, every CIO's uh, first priority in these days moving to cloud. And some domains like financial sector, healthcare sector, we never thought that they will move to the cloud based on the discussion we had uh, five, 10 years back uh, with the regulations and then uh, data privacy, um, the financial sector and healthcare sector, they never thought that they will move. But what uh, we are experiencing today is totally different, right? All these organizations are moving to the cloud, at least come to the middle ground and have a hybrid approach by moving certain uh, workloads into the cloud and keeping certain uh, data or systems inside their on-premise deployments. So the, the uh, move into the cloud is happening in two steps. Uh, first step is uh, migrating. So that's basically you take your workload 
uh, into a cloud environment that we call lift and shift. This is easy. But the problem with uh, that, uh, you will run your applications inside the cloud environment, but you will not utilize all the cloud capabilities. And you will end with a huge bill uh, from the cloud uh, service provider because uh, these applications are not built for cloud. It might be utilizing a lot of uh, system resources and uh, you will end up paying a lot for these cloud uh, uh, service providers. I'm not telling that's a wrong approach. Uh, you can take that approach, uh, lift and shift your workloads into the cloud, but at the same time, you should consider modernizing your applications as well. So that's where the uh, step two, the application modernization comes into the picture, and you have to uh, redeploy uh, these uh, uh, existing workloads at uh, cloud based applications. So you had to re-architect, you had to rebuild, and you had to redeploy these uh, capabilities into a cloud environment. So that's where uh, this two-step process will happen. So this is not easy. As I explained, you had to move the uh, uh, workload into a cloud environment. At the same time, you have to re-architect uh, these uh, uh, components. So it's a challenge because you need special skill sets, uh, you need um, uh, proper planning, and then you have to understand new architecture patterns. Uh, all these things are there, so it's not easy. And then again, it takes time as well. You have to business as usual while uh, doing this change. Uh, so uh, you need to uh, handle this carefully. That's where you need a new engineering paradigm. So we call this new engineering paradigm mass cloud native engineering. And it's not only about the technology as you see in the screen. Um, and we have divided into three stages, people, process, and technology. So I'll start with the technology because we were talking about technology uh, from the beginning. Uh, so it's about how you can utilize different type of open standards and how you can have a, uh, a standard way of communicating is the first thing that you should consider. Then uh, you have to look at how you can automate everything uh, because uh, uh, there will be a lot of moving components. I will explain uh, why we have a lot of um, moving components in a different slide, uh, but uh, you need to focus on that. And there are fundamental things like observability, um, continuous integration, and how you can take uh, this development, uh, uh, the things that you build in your development environments into production in a quick interval because the consumers are waiting to utilize this new capability. That's why you see a lot of updates happening uh, if you are using a smartphone, a smart car, or any other appliance that connects to uh, the um, these kind of digital capabilities. And then the uh, you need to secure this environment because now you are moving to the cloud. Uh, so it is not like uh, gated uh, as before in your uh, own data center. Uh, but uh, I think cloud is providing great level of uh, security that uh, if you plan it properly, you can build a really secure system. But then again, it might be new. Uh, for the development team, architecture team, as well as the DevOps team. Uh, so you had to go through that learning curve, learn these things and apply the technology. Then the process wise, um, there are a lot of things that apply here, uh, especially uh, agile principles, microservices style type of uh, uh, componentized architecture and uh, you need to uh, develop for auto scaling and resiliency because uh, not like earlier days you can't have any downtime of these applications right because uh, everybody's looking for um, uh, high availability and then seamless uh, or continuous experience from these digital application because in some cases digital is the only way so without having this 100% uh, uptime, you will be not able to deliver these capabilities to the end users. And you need to think about the APIs. We will talk about uh, in detail about this uh, in a different slide. And then uh, you can 
uh, enhance your security by providing uh, access to your data sets only through APIs. And then you can have improved and strong governance across uh, the uh, cloud environment by bringing different type of policies. It is not like uh, previous uh, development practices and uh, IT policies that you will enforce this stuff manually. It's about uh, make the policies part of your pipeline or automation and enforce it across the organization. Then uh, the uh, last but not least, the people is the key component in this entire journey. So we need to have a proper environment. We have to empower, we have to um, uh, give more autonomy for these teams and uh, Amazon created a nice concept of uh, how they, we can have productive teams by uh, deploying autonomous teams and providing that uh, autonomy for these teams to plan, build, run these applications, take feedback and improve. So we have to move to that level of uh, autonomy and then uh, team uh, uh, diversity inside the organization to use cloud native engineering properly. So uh, let's uh, look at the abstractions because uh, that is the uh, one of the main areas that we need to look at. And abstractions apply in real life as well as heavily utilized in uh, computer science as well. So what happens with abstractions, like when we recognize uh, a common recurring patterns, uh, we kind of identify what are the required things to implement these solutions and filter out the additional details because additional details creating noise it doesn't help to solve problems that's where this uh, abstraction will help us to focus and then identify the necessary uh, information uh, to be productive and deliver these solutions so as i explained uh, the uh, abstractions are uh, very important in computer science. And if you have the right level of abstractions, it will result or enhance agility inside your organization. And then it creates a lot of uh, uh, interoperability in between systems, data, and people. And uh, you should be able to relocate your workloads. As example, uh, if you had the proper abstractions in the code or the applications that you wrote and deploy on premise, uh, when you relocate these things by shift and lift into a cloud environment, then it's easy. And it has to be uh, uh, updatable. All these applications are getting uh, bug fixes, feature enhancements, so you need to update it. And the abstraction helps to uh, make it uh, updatable. And the reusability uh, increased with abstractions as well. Uh, as example, APIs is a really good example. When you have a lot of APIs uh, defined inside the organization, you can uh, reuse the business capabilities that you are exposing using uh, these APIs. And then data sets, like if you have common uh, reusable data sets, uh, it uh, increases the reusability and how you create uh, these uh, common reusable data sets again uh, by uh, incorporating abstraction into the data layer. And it creates uh, resiliency as well. Uh, as we know, we need to have a high resiliency. In if something goes wrong, system should come back to a previous state and start providing the same experience for the end users and it creates a lot of transparency as well that's where the open standards coming and then uh, open source uh, uh, type of uh, development practices coming in handy uh, so when you have that type of uh, practices it creates an abstraction and provide transparency for the developers as well as uh, the consumers who's using these applications so that's the importance of uh, abstraction in uh, when it comes to technology or especially computer science. So uh, if we narrow down this abstraction concepts into cloud native development, because that's our main focus today. Uh, so uh, we can put it into three buckets, the components, or the component level abstraction, deployment level abstraction, and runtime management.
So the component level abstraction, uh, if we uh, look at it in detail, it's about uh, how you can have abstraction at the service creation level, how you use uh, like a, a standard interfaces for the services and uh, how you can have a standard definition for these services. So I use the term services, but it can be microservices, mini services, um, or um, any uh, other uh, like uh, uh, so our base services that we used to use for a long time. And then uh, the component level abstraction comes with the data manipulation as well. Uh, while we are creating data sets, while we are accessing data sets, as well as how we define different type of data models. So we call them as uh, business objects inside our applications. We can have these uh, uh, abstractions at the component level. Once you have that abstraction, especially in the business objects, you can reuse these business objects across the organization. You can standardize it. As an example, uh, a financial institute that I'm working, they wanted to uh, standardize all the business objects. So that way, any API that they expose through the system will use the same business object. And any report that they uh, provide for the uh, business, they will it will use the same uh, business object. Like that, you can have that abstraction at the component level. Then the deployment abstraction is really important because uh, we can't stick to one uh, cloud provider or a cloud platform. So uh, yes, Kubernetes is bringing some kind of uh, abstraction at the deployment or the infrastructure level, but uh, having that uh, uh, abstraction of the deployable unit is very important. There are many standards like um, uh, uh, coming up in the industry as well as we used to use in the industry. But uh, I think using a container like Docker image as the uh, uh, deployable unit is a really good approach. Then you can take this particular image into any cloud platform and deploy it because all the cloud platforms are supporting Kubernetes uh, these days. So that way you can have a common deployable unit across any environment that you are using today as well as you are planning to use in the future. In the runtime management wise, uh, you can abstract the API management uh, components as well as you can abstract the observability. So once you abstract the observability, you can uh, collect uh, these uh, uh, different type of interactions happening inside your digital environment and provide more and more insight to your uh, users as well as as a uh, uh, technology uh, uh, technologies, you can look at this observability data and make uh, smart decisions on improving the experience as well as improving the um, uh, deployment and uh, high availability, those type of service level uh, capabilities that you need to uh, take care of as well as important to have a stable deployment inside your cloud native environment. So those are the three main categories, components, deployment, and runtime management that we can see in the uh, cloud native uh, development. So let's uh, look at uh, from the beginning that we spoke about digital experience and cloud native uh, technologies enabling this uh, digital experience or so creation of digital experience. And uh, we identify we need the paradigm shift because uh, to utilize the cloud native uh, technologies properly as well as to simplify some of the complexities that you see inside the cloud native technologies. That's where the new paradigm comes that we call as the cloud native engineering. So it's a concept. So you need to uh, develop the, these applications by uh, looking at these concepts. So you need cloud native developers. And developers using uh, programming languages to do the development. So uh, we need to have a cloud native programming language to make the developers productive as well as let them to build applications fit into cloud native environments. So the uh, abstractions that we talk about early should start from the bottom. So if you have proper abstractions at the programming language level, you can take it to the next level and up to the digital experience level as well. So uh, that's how we should approach. And as a technology provider, we looked 
at this as well. And uh, we started uh, uh, looking at how we can help the um, uh, help the industry uh, by uh, providing a proper cloud native programming language, which has the correct level of abstractions. And in 2017, we announced about Ballerina. So Ballerina is a language that uh, we, WSO2, created, and we position it as a cloud native programming language uh, that uh, we use it as the foundation for this entire cloud native journey. And you can see a uh, uh, sample code in the right-hand side. Uh, and if you go to uh, ballerina.io, you can find more information about this uh, language as well. So to give some highlights about the language, uh, the key differentiate of this language, it has the graphical and textual parity that uh, you can draw code as well as you can uh, do the coding uh, using a text editor like uh, we used to do, like you can use an uh, editor like VS Code uh, that is very popular among the developers these days because you can code anything using uh, VS Code with, uh, I mean, by installing a plugin for that particular language. So with this graphical and uh, textual parity, you can uh, use uh, a no code experience with the graphical interface, and then you can go to a code and by combining these two, you can have a low code experience as well. So the abstraction we created at that level, allowing us to have this graphical and textual parity. In this case, picture is the code and the code is the picture. So you can edit the picture, the code will change and you can edit the code, the picture will change. So uh, even a developer can go offline by use their favorite IDE and bring back that code into the uh, Ballerina supported IDE and get the graphical experience as well. And it has the first class concepts of uh, network programming. And if you notice uh, uh, one more uh, thing that uh, the as a developer or a architect, you might have used a lot of uh, middleware in the past, but with this cloud movement, microservices, API-driven architecture, and the development practices, middleware is moving to code and infrastructure. So the infrastructure-wise, uh, these cloud providers and uh, platforms like Kubernetes providing these capabilities. Um, and then the uh, uh, because of that, having those network programming and concurrency-related capabilities within the language is very useful. So as I explain, uh, if you are interested, you can go to this uh, uh, web page that I explained, ballerina.io, and find more information. So we didn't stop there. We created the abstraction at the language level, and we went into the digital experience level. So we built a, a platform called Curio. It's for innovation, speed, and the productivity by using Ballerina as the foundation. So you can have that uh, seamless capability inside this uh, platform. It's at the uh, public uh, beta level now. You can go and uh, create an account. Uh, you can go to wsu.com slash choreo and create an account. So these are uh, some high-level capabilities that we are providing inside Choreo. Uh, so the foundation is Ballerina, as I explained, and all these uh, code, low-code, API, uh, deployment-related abstractions are uh, primary capabilities inside uh, Choreo as well. So this is a screenshot of a Curio editor and that graphic. Uh, so the picture is the code. Code is the picture that I explained. You can see here that you have the picture on your left hand side and the code in your right hand side. So you can uh, use both or you can stick to one uh, side of the story and start editing uh, the code and doing the modifications. So we, uh, as I explained, so we got the abstractions at the language level. We moved to a platform level uh, with Curio, but uh, we are uh, we have not stopped there. We are continuing our journey of this uh, cloud native technology support. Uh, in that journey, uh, I would like to uh, provide an announcement as well. So October 13, that is today, uh, we are. Uh, bringing our uh, the other crowd. It's basically uh, mainly focusing on customer identity and access management. So we have a, a customer identity and access management product that's used by many organizations. And 
we are enabling it uh, as a cloud experience. So it was uh, um, uh, in the beta stage for a while now that we shared it with known uh, uh, users and got their feedback and improved it. And from today onwards, we are moving to the early adoption stage. So our uh, the identity server or the CIAM uh, component supporting enterprises to build a uh, different type of identity and access management scenarios. But this IDAS or identity access service offering as cardio is mainly uh, targeting the small to medium businesses as well as startups. But um, uh, even enterprises can uh, take a look at different scenarios. And if you have uh, a use case, we are happy to discuss it with you. And you can um, go and create an account on wsu.com slash Ascardio and create an account and start using it. As I uh, explained, it is moving to early adoption stage from today. And you will see a lot of uh, press uh, information uh, shared today uh, because today is the launch date. I think uh, the launch time will be uh, morning PST. Uh, in a uh, few hours that you will find more information about it. And I'm excited to announce this uh, news and share it with you. So if I summarize what we discussed, uh, so we discussed about uh, uh, the uh, uh, moving to the cloud and then uh, the paradigm shift of cloud native engineering. And we need to have the correct level of abstraction, as well as how WS2 is supporting it with Ballerina, Corio, and the new uh, brand new product uh, or the cloud service called Ascardio. And, uh, but if you noticed uh, during this session, you might have identified it's not about the technology. That's why I, I have highlighted this uh, uh, quote, basically the cloud native development is a cultural mind shift beyond technology because you can't just focus on the technology, uh, you have to look at the other aspects as well. So during uh, the next keynote, you will get more information about it. 